No. Well, good morning, and it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, we're going to be beginning, uh, beginning a study in, uh, I always called it Habakkuk, and then the other day I was looking at it, and I thought, I wonder if that's how you actually pronounce it, because we read it and don't always pronounce it, and I went online, how to pronounce, and, uh, and I looked it up, and there was a, some people do pronounce it that way, Habakkuk, um, but there was a Jewish man who said it's pronounced with the emphasis on the second syllable, Habakkuk. So that's how I'm going to say it from now on, uh, now, that, uh, now that we know. You know, Habakkuk is an interesting book, one that we don't go to a lot. It's one of those little tiny books in the, uh, towards the end of the Old Testament. But as I read it again, and obviously I've read it in the past, but I read it again, it just seemed to jump out to me as an extremely relevant book, almost as if we we're reading the newspaper. <laughs> It is so relevant for us today, and so we're going to walk through that a little bit this morning. Um, I'm, I haven't really given you an outline. I've just given you my sort of thoughts as we go along here, and at the end, we're going to leave a few things for you to work on on your own, uh, because it is an interesting uh, book to read. Uh, so let's um, open in prayer, and then we'll go to our, <coughs> our study, and uh, Hopefully, we'll be able to pull a few things out that'll be helpful as you move through this. Uh, Father, again, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for what we read in it, uh, some historical, but even in the historical, uh, we get a picture and a, and a revelation of your character, of your person, uh, of your wisdom, of your attributes. And so, our Father, we just pray that as we uh, read through this book together, as the, uh, the ladies are studying this book in the coming weeks, uh, that they would draw closer to you. <clears throat> so, our Father, we just commit our time to you this morning. We ask your blessing on it as we ask for your wisdom and direction and discernment. Uh, we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. So, here we are, Habakkuk. I'm going to see if this will work. Uh, let's, where do I point it there? There we go. Okay. So I would call this, as I read through the book, the premise of the prophecy. Now, Habakkuk is a little bit different than many books because in many of the minor prophets and the major prophets, the Lord comes to the prophet, gives them a message, and then th their responsibility is to go to the people and share that message. Here, it doesn't happen that way. It is a prophecy, but Habakkuk has a burden. That's what we read as you start the book. It says in that verse 1, the burden which the prophet, prophet Habakkuk saw. And so he looked at the world around him. He looked at the, the chaos in the world that was around him, literally a world on fire. Uh, he was concerned. He was greatly burdened by what he saw. Uh, and as we look around our world today, and we're not talking about politics, but we're talking about the news we don't have to look at the news for very long to become very discouraged, to become fearful, to have great anxiety, whether it's COVID or conflict or war or, or things that uh, our children are facing and our grandchildren are facing. These things concern us. And when fear comes, doubt comes. Uh, that's just how it happens in our lives. We begin to could be concerned about it. And so that's where we find the beginning of this book, the premise of the prophecy. I put a picture there of a, of a city on fire. We're very fortunate uh, in, the, in North America that we don't see this. But many parts of the world, this is every day. This is every day. We work very closely at, at the ministry, uh, <clears throat> Everyday Publications, with a group in Northeast Congo. And uh, they have been literally at war since... Uh, the 2000s, since, 19, since 2000, 2001. Uh, they now just number them, the, the, the civil war, the civil war, the civil war. Currently, there are over 100 rebel groups that are fighting the government and fighting each other, mostly for control of the enormous wealth that's there. Uh, everybody that has a cell phone or an electric car or anything that's electronic needs lithium or needs these heavy metals. Congo is one of the richest places in the world for these heavy metals. And so the Russians are there, the Chinese are there, the Americans are there, the French are there. Everybody's there. Uh, and unfortunately, the people are the ones who are suffering in that country. 
Uh, we had a meeting with our group uh, last week on Friday, a Zoom meeting. We meet once a month. And since in the last month, over a thousand people in just their one province have been murdered. A thousand people. We don't really understand what that means. I mean, a province is probably about the size of, of Dubuque County. A thousand people murdered in, in that time. And, uh, and their homes destroyed, homes burned down, hospitals destroyed, uh, schools destroyed. Uh, it's just a terrible, terrible thing. And yet, the Lord is working in amazing ways. There are over 300 assemblies in that, or churches, I mean, brethren like this one, in that province alone. That would be the same as saying well, there's, there's a 300 Arbor Oaks in Dubuque County. It's amazing what the Lord is doing there. Down in the Katanga province, which is in the southern part of the country, there are over a thousand assemblies in that area, and there's evangelism, and there's baptism, and there's new churches starting, and people are getting saved. And so the Lord works even in these terrible times. And so that's a comfort and encouragement for us. And so as we come to the book, we see this, this world in chaos. Evil is everywhere. Uh, evil is reigning through the area. And uh, this Habakkuk has a series of questions, and so that would be the purpose of our book. Uh, and the, really, Habakkuk's questions come down to just two questions. Uh, as you read through uh, chapter 1, you'll see there's a series, one after another, of questions. But they really come down to two questions, and we're going to look at each of those two questions a little bit more. And each time, the Lord responds to his question, and certainly in the first case, Habakkuk does not like the answer that God gives. And I think that we're going to talk a little bit about that because sometimes we pray for things. We pray and God answers our prayer, but it's not in the way that we thought he would answer our prayer. And sometimes we're not really happy. It's not the way I wanted it to turn out. But God has a better plan and we have to yield to his, uh, his sovereignty and into his wisdom uh, because his uh, plans are not our plans. Our plans need to be his plans, uh, not the other way around. But God patiently responds to him again. And then we get to chapter 3. Chapter 3 is a wonderful chapter. Just of these three chapters, it is a chapter of worship. And Habakkuk comes to the point where he says, I don't understand. I don't understand, but I worship. I worship you, even though I don't understand. We don't have to understand everything all of the, all of the time. And so as we come to this, uh, this passage, and I'm, I'm not going to read the passage. Uh, the book, we could probably sit and read it in, in just a few minutes, but you've all read it. Uh, we're going to come here to the problems that have brought them to where they are today. The kingdom of Israel, or the nation of Israel, is now split. Uh, in the days of Solomon, Solomon was the, um, uh, the son of David, King David, and David was the great warrior king. Uh, he had expanded the nation of Israel uh, to, a, to a huge nation that had respect uh, it was no longer just a little city of Jerusalem. It was a, a nation that uh, had respect in the area. And God came to Solomon early in his uh, life and said to him, I'm going to ask you to, you can ask me for anything you want. Anything you want. And we all know the story. Solomon said, I want wisdom. I want wisdom and I want knowledge because this is a great nation and I can't do it in my own strength. And God gave him uh, wisdom. But of course, Solomon uh, was a very wise man, but made some very bad decisions in his life. Uh, we were thinking about this in another study just a few days ago. Uh, over his life, he had too many, too many soldiers, too many chariots, too many horses, and too many wives. And, uh, and they led him away from the Lord. He started to put his faith in, in some of the, uh, uh, the relationships. I mean, he had this, these wives and, and concubines, uh, not because he just you know, loved wives so much, but because they uh, formed relationships and bonds and, and associations with other nations. Uh, but with that, it brought idolatry and it brought many things into his life that were not good. And so um, during the days of, uh, of uh, Solomon, uh, he had a, um, a son, Rehoboam, but he also had a servant, Jeroboam. And those names are very similar uh, and Jeroboam was one of his servants who rebelled against the king, rebelled against Solomon, even during Solomon's lifetime. And Solomon said, that's it, we're done. And he, and he sent out a, an arrest warrant for him, and uh, he fled. 
Jeroboam fled. Eventually, Solomon passed away and his son Rehoboam took the throne. And all of a sudden, Jeroboam came back and he began to stir up trouble and he began to create problems in the nation of, of, uh, of Israel. And uh, he came with a group of men from the 10 northern tribes and he said, we want uh, to reduce the taxes. The tax burden is too great on us. And Rehoboam refused. And so they rebelled. And Jeroboam took those 10 nations and split the nation in half. The nation was divided into two nations. The 10 tribes in the north, the tribes up in the north under uh, Jeroboam, uh, was the kingdom of Israel. The two tribes in the south, which was Judah and Benjamin, was the kingdom of Judah. And so now, what had been this amazing, amazing, let's just look at for a minute here. If you look at, that's what Solomon's kingdom was. Um, I don't think I've got a button on here to press, yeah. So here's Jerusalem, kind of right here in the middle. And at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, I think maybe just up here to the Sea of Galilee, this was about the extent of Israel. Under Solomon, it went all the way up here to the Euphrates River, all the way up here, it included Assyria, Syria, Damascus, and what today would be um, Jordan. I mean, uh, well, yeah, Jordan, because it's here on the east side as well, on the east side of the Jordan River. Uh, it would include Jordan and Lebanon and, and uh, Syria and, and some of these other countries up here in parts of uh, Iraq as well. And so it was this huge city. Now it was a huge country, but now it was split uh, into two. And so these are a couple of important dates we want to think about because they are very critical to where we are. The first one is the split. The kingdom of Israel divided into two parts. The northern kingdom separated in 975 BC. Uh, I like history, but I know not everybody likes history. Um, but that's an important date because that's the date of the split. The people of uh, the northern kingdom in 722, well, starting from about 720 to about 740, uh, they had moved away from God. Every one of the kings of Israel, the northern kingdom, was a wicked king that led them into idolatry. They um, eventually fell to the nation of Assyria. Tiglath-Pileser uh, was one of the most brutal uh, men of the day. He was known for his brutality. And he came descended on the, uh, the nation of Israel, the, north, the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, took all the people and deported them. Uh, he didn't just conquer them. He took them and he dispersed them to the four corners of, of the world uh, because if they were not together, they had no power. And so he split them up. And today we don't know where those 10 tribes are anymore. They're the 10, some call them the 10 lost tribes of Israel. Uh, we don't know where they are anymore. But the southern kingdom remained. The southern kingdom, the uh, nation of, or the kingdom of Judah remained, but even they uh, were subject to invasion. Over time, the Babylonian Empire, which was growing and growing and growing, here it's referred to as the Chaldeans. I think in some of your Bibles it would say, God says, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. That's the Babylonians. Uh, those are the ones coming from Persia. They came in and they uh, uh, overthrew the Assyrian government and, uh, and then also came in and invaded the, uh, the nation of Judah, or the kingdom of Judah. Uh, the kingdom of Judah still had its, uh, its headquarters in, um, in Jerusalem. Uh, the kingdom of Israel had its headquarters in Samaria. And we were very familiar with that. If we've read the New Testament, we know about the kingdom of Samaria. Uh, but the, the kingdom of Judah eventually also began to uh, creep away from God. They began... Some of their kings were very good, some of their kings were not. And they too began to move away from God, take on some of the idols of the surrounding nations. And in 7, uh, 722, um, or, or rather five, in 586, uh, the Lord came in uh, through uh, the Chaldeans and, uh, and took them away. And so where is Habakkuk in all of this? Where do we find him in this history? Uh, and so that's why we want to think about why it makes sense, why the uh, prophecies make sense when we think about uh, the dates. So let's go here. Here's the two kingdoms. Uh, we've got Israel up in the north with their headquarters up here in Samaria. We've got the southern kingdom of Judah in the south with Jerusalem as their headquarters. 
now the uh, northern kingdom has gone. And uh, let me go here. The prophets began. Now, we know of the major prophets. We think about the major prophets. That would include uh, people like Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied through both kingdoms, all the way through the kingdom of uh, Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Uh, and eventually, uh, he was gone. Jeremiah prophesied uh, up to the destruction of Israel, uh, or, or to the destruction of Judah, rather. And then Daniel and Ezekiel, these are the four major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel and Ezekiel. Daniel and Ezekiel were taken as part of that a group that were taken to Babylon, along with many of the people of, the, um, of Israel when they were destroyed there. And then we have what they've referred to as the minor prophets, 12 minor prophets. And they're not minor because they're less important. They're just minor because they're shorter books. Um, you know, the, the Jeremiah and, and Isaiah are long books, uh, huge books, huge prophetic books. Uh, and now you come to somewhere like uh, Habakkuk, that's only three chapters, or Obadiah, that's only one chapter. They're just minor because they're shorter. They're very focused, very focused prophecies. Um, some of the contemporaries of Habakkuk would include people <coughs> like uh, Jeremiah was there uh, as one of the major prophets, uh, possibly Obadiah. Although Obadiah, uh, his prophecy was to a country outside of uh, the nation of Israel. And then Zephaniah uh, was another one as well. And so these are the 12 minor prophets, and those are the dates. Now, the dates are not exact because nobody seems to know exactly where they are. Sometimes Obadiah is placed later, but Obadiah, Joel, Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Micah, Zephaniah, Nahum, and then Habakkuk. Um, and you'll see his prophecy was some, somewhere between 612 and 606. And we know that because it was right prior to the capture of the nation of Judah, the kingdom of Judah. So that's how we know. Uh, each of the little uh, phrases behind it is the meaning of the name of the prophet. And we'll see here that Habakkuk's was to embrace or the embracer or the one who clings. And, uh, and we get that. We get that picture as we go through it um, together. So those were the major prophets of the day. Here's where they prophesied. I don't know if you can see from up here. Uh, up here, uh, around 700 and, and 760, Hosea and Amos were prophesying up here. Uh, Joel, nobody knows exactly where he was when he did his prophecy or the date, but they kind of put him somewhere around here. And then down in the south, most of the minor prophets were down here. And so you see Micah, uh, Ma the major, Isaiah was down here, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Jeremiah, and they all prophesied right up until the, um, the deportation of all of the people when the, when the nation of Ju kingdom of Judah was conquered. Right here, you see this, this is when the people were taken away. They were taken captive. And then after that, Haggai, uh, Zechariah, and Malachi prophesied after uh, they came back to the, uh, to the people of uh, Judah or to the nation, they came back to Jerusalem. Do you remember with uh, Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the walls and the rebuilding of the temple? And so let's look at the questions that we have here. Oh, this is a timeline. And I'll send this to you if you want. I don't know if anyone's interested in this. I, I kind of like this, but again, you probably can't see it very well here. But on the orange one or the brownish ones, those are the minor prophets. The green ones are the major prophets. But you see the fall of Samaria. Um, you have people like Isaiah uh, uh, coming up to it and almost all the way through it. And then Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel were the major ones, and then some of the other ones that happened. And then down here, this is encouraging, the walls are rebuilt. And you have Ezra, Nehemiah, Malachi. That's towards the end of the Old Testament. And then God doesn't speak for nearly 400 years. God is silent in the Old Testament. But here's the questions uh, of Habakkuk. And I just want to read that first part of that first verse, or rather verse number two. Uh, it says, the prophet's question, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? How long shall I cry and you will not hear? And then the next three or four verses are the continuation of that question. But just that phrase, how long, how long? And, you know, that's one of the most common uh, prayers that we have in Scripture. How long? In Job, you find, and I put a couple here in your notes there, Job, how long will you torment my soul? He says to God. David, 
David repeatedly uses this one as he looks at the world around him. How long, Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? In Psalm 89. And then in Psalm 94, how long will the wicked triumph? That's really one of the questions that Habakkuk is asking as well. How long will the wicked triumph? Jeremiah, how long will the land mourn? And the herbs of every field wither. The beasts and the birds are consumed for the wickedness of those who dwell there. Habakkuk, we just read, read now. Zechariah, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem? And then all the way in the book of Revelation, we read there the prayers of the souls of the martyrs or the cry of the souls of the martyrs, those who have lost their lives uh, because of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. And so that's a cry that we have a lot. And I don't know everybody's circumstance right now and your situation in life, but there are times in the life of almost everybody when it seems like the trials and the difficulties and the, and the challenges that we face are so severe and we are so helpless we are so unable to, to solve those problems ourself, we, ourselves. We recognize our inability and we cry out to the Lord, how long, how long? I often look at the world that just every day seems to get darker. It just seems like, like light and righteousness is being slowly squeezed out of this world. And the evil one is increasing his power and his dominance of it. But you know, really, this is not the worst time that the world has ever known. There have been many times worse than now. I remember back, it was in, at the end of 1969, um, I remember my mom saying, we were just about to go from the, the 60s into the 70s, and it was right at the end of the year, and she said, I am convinced that the Lord is coming back any minute because this world cannot get more evil than it is right now. That's what she said in 1969. <laughs> and it's almost as if the world said, you know, watch, I'll show you how evil we can get. And the world is far more evil. Or maybe it's the same amount of evil, but it's just more visible to us. It's everywhere. We see it all over. And so it is possible sometimes for us to cry out, how long, Lord, until you come? How long till you deal with the evil that's in this world? It's not an uncommon question. And so God responds. And God says down in verse 5, and I don't want to read too much of the verses because I know this is your study. But he says, the Lord says to him, look, out, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you. And I can imagine that Habakkuk was like, great, this is amazing. I will work a work in your life, in your days, which you would not believe, though it were told you. And then the Lord goes on in verse 6 to say, for indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans to judge the nation of Judah, the kingdom of Judah. And it's like, what? They are the worst people in the world. They're even worse than the people that are here. Um, and so he was just stunned that God would do it. And, you know, I think about that, and I think about the way that we sometimes pray. And we pray that the Lord would do a certain thing, and God answers in a way that we didn't expect. And sometimes it's almost as though we're disappointed in the answer that God gives. You know, we think of the people of Israel, or the people, well, the people of Israel who were in captivity. They were in Egypt, and they cried out to the Lord. They were, they were in bondage. They were slaves. And the Lord said, I will send a deliverer. And he sent Moses. And Moses was the deliverer who took them out of Egypt. And how they rejoiced as they came out of Egypt. And then the Lord left them for 40 years, wandering in the wilderness until they cried out and rebelled against God. I want to go back to Egypt, the place that they were crying about. They wanted to go back there. God didn't answer it exactly the way. But God needed to work in their lives and in their nation in order to accomplish what he needed to accomplish before they could go into the promised land, before they could go into the place that God had prepared for them. We find, too, uh, Jonah. Remember Jonah? Uh, God said, I want you to go and preach to the Ninevites. Well, the Ninevites were part of that Assyrian group. 
uh, they literally, if you, and I don't encourage you to go, but if you want to read about them, you know, just read about the, the barbarity of that nation. Uh, the things that they did to their conquered people were just inhuman. They were feared throughout all the world. And so when God said, I want you to go and preach to them, preach salvation to them and repentance to them, Jonah's like, I, don't, I am not going there because I, that's not what I want for them. I don't want them to repent. I don't want them to be saved. I want them to be destroyed. But God had a better plan. God had a better plan. And sometimes that's how our prayers. And so when the Lord responds in a way that we don't expect, or especially a way that we don't like, we just have to bow to the Lord's goodness and bow to his wisdom and our lack of wisdom to say, I rest in you. I rest in, in what you've given me to do. Sometimes uh, in our own lives, we pray for strength. And God doesn't just give us strength. How does God answer that prayer when we pray for strength? He tests us. He gives us things that will increase our strength. Sometimes we pray for patience. What does God do? <laughs> He gives us things that will test our patience. And it's like, I didn't ask for this. It's like, well, you did when you asked for patience. When we ask God, help me to increase my faith. He takes away all those things that we have our faith in. The things of the world. He sometimes takes so that our faith is in him. And so we have to understand how God answers prayer. How God deals with those things. And that's why this book is so amazingly relevant to, our, to individuals, to all of us today. The second question that we have, um, sorry, I think I missed some things here. Uh, we ask for patience. We, um, the second question we have is, why do you look on those who deal treacherously? And so he's thinking there, of course, of the Babylonians, of these Chaldeans that he mentioned there. And uh, he, in verse 12, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die O oh Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O oh rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. And then says, why do you look on those who deal treacherously? And so the first thing that Habakkuk does is he reminds God of his goodness, of his purity. Like God needs reminding of that. He doesn't. But it's good that he goes back to him and said, God, you are a perfect, righteous, pure, just God. How can you use those people to do this? And we ask those same questions. How can God allow these things to happen? How can God uh, bring these things uh, into our lives? And so he goes on to remind God of the character of the Babylonians. Well, again, God doesn't need reminding of that. But as you read down in the rest of that um, portion, the rest of chapter 1, he talks about how treacherous they are. They're deceptive. They're deceitful. They're liars. They're wicked, depraved, evil, immoral, and perverted. As you read that description, you'll see that. They're voracious. They are an insatiable people. They just gobble up everything in their path. They are ravenous, ferocious, predatory, and they're murderous. They think nothing of murdering men, women, and children. They're brutal, cruel, savage, crippling people. And so again, he asks and cries out to the Lord, why? Why do you look on those uh, who deal treacherously? But we thank the Lord that he does answer. He does answer. In chapter 2, uh, at the beginning of chapter 2, we, we get a, a reference here at the beginning where uh, it seems almost as though uh, Habakkuk recognizes that the questions that he's asked of God were maybe presumptuous. He says there, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. So again, he's humbling himself here before the Lord. I'm going to watch. You invited me to watch. You said, look, I'm going to watch, and I will, I will think about what I will answer when I am corrected. We get this wonderful verse here when the Lord does answer him, and we get that verse that we know from the New Testament, but actually has its roots in the Old Testament. 
in verse 4. God says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The just shall live by his faith. And so God is answering his questions. God then goes on, and I've underlined them here in my Bible, and if you like to underline things, that would be a good thing to do. There are five woes. Uh, these are warnings against the people that God is going to use. God is saying, I'm going to use them to judge the nation of Judah, the kingdom of Judah, but then they themselves will be judged. They also will be judged. And so he says here that we call them the five woes. Woe to him who increases what is not his. In verse 6 of chapter 2. They're all in chapter 2. We see their aggression. Those that take what's not theirs. Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house. Verse 9. It's those who are motivated by greed. That's a world that we see today. Those who are motivated by aggression and are motivated by greed. And then number three, woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed. They build all of their wealth on the backs of others, using the blood of others. We see violence is the way of, uh, that they use. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor. That's an interesting one in verse 15. It says, woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. You are filled with shame instead of glory. And so we think here of immorality. They were ones who were seeking to undermine the moral fabric of the people around them, and whether it's alcohol or drugs or, or pornography or whatever it is that undermines the fabric uh, of the society. They will be judged. They are governed by immorality. And then lastly, woe to him who says to wood awake. Now that's an interesting one. We have to kind of read it in context. Verse 18 begins, what profit is the image that its maker should carve it? The molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols. Woe to him who says to wood awake. And so this is the, this is the craziness of idolatry is that they would create something with their own hands. They would have to carve it or mold it or, or form it into metal by melting other things and then give it power over them. It's like, you created it. How can this thing have power? Woe to him who says to wood, awake. Uh, but we see that in the world today. We certainly see those that worship actual physical idols, but we see people who worship idols all around us, whether it's material things or um, even good things can become an idol in our lives. Um, you know, we all need uh, money to survive. We've got to pay our, our rent or our mortgage or our electricity bill. Um, but when that becomes the thing that we worship, that thing that is most important to us, it's become an idol to us. Um, our job, it could be our career, can become an idol. Even our family could become an idol if we put it before God. And so we have to be very careful in, in all of these things. Woe to him uh, who creates something that is inanimate uh, in order to worship it. And so as we go on from there, we see this uh, worship. Let's go to chapter 3, because chapter 3 is a much uh, more encouraging uh, chapter than the ones that we've read. Uh, but I would encourage you as you go through that to think about the motivation of the people that they're talking about. And beginning at, uh, of uh, chapter 3, it says, A prayer of Habakkuk, the, the prophet, on Shigianoth. And uh, I did look that one up to see how to pronounce it, and then I forgot how to pronounce it, because that's not how you, the other person pronounced it. Um, and then in my margin, it says, Exact meaning unknown. So it's like it's there, but we don't know what it means. Um, but some believe that it is a prayer that is of extreme uh, urgency, uh, something that is highly important, very, very important. But here he goes, the Habakkuk, the, the prophet, is saying, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. And then he prays for this. This is our prayer today. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. 
And so now we've come out of the Old Testament, we've come into the New Testament, and we see that God has brought mercy where there should be judgment in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We were far from God. We were separated from God because of our sin. We were much like the people of Judah, consumed with the things of the world. And yet we are introduced to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who stood in our place, our substitute, who took upon himself the penalty for our sins. And we see instead of wrath, we see mercy. And so he worships God for that, or revive your work. Sometimes we pray in our prayer meetings, revive the work. We want the Lord to revive his work. Uh, but where does revival begin? It begins right here. We can't pray for revival in sort of an intangible way. It's revive me first. Re revive my family first. Revive my local assembly first. And when that happens, then revival comes. And it comes through prayer and it comes through uh, spending time with the Lord, it comes from spending time in His Word, of reading His Word, meditating upon Him, spending time with Him. Revive your work. Over in chapter 13, we then get a messianic reference where it says, You marched through the lands in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. And so here's a prophetic look forward that there is a coming day when there will be a redeemer. Again, that's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes I feel as we come to the end of this chapter that we're a little bit like, uh, like uh, Habakkuk here. We've kind of run out of, we've just run out of hope. We're, we're living in despair. Uh, it just seems like everything around us is not good. Um, and I know that that's not with us all the time, but sometimes it is. We'll see a family member who's sick with a terminal illness, or we'll, we'll lose a, a loved one, or we'll see uh, a break in, in, a, in fellowship or relationship with a family member. Maybe one of our children wander away. We pray for our children. We pray for our, our grandchildren all the time, because many of them know the truth, and yet they have decided to walk away. They're no longer following after God. It breaks our hearts. It breaks the heart of the Lord when he sees that happen. And so he, we read in verse 17, it's really a hymn of faith, but it doesn't start off that way. It says in verse 17, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flocks may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. That's a terrible prayer <laughs> up to that point. It's like a prayer of, of desperation. Everything I need is not there. We get that great word, verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk on my high hills. And so sometimes we can do that too. We look around, we, we just, we're discouraged. Uh, we feel like things are not going the way that I had hoped they'd go. It's important that we recognize that just as as the prophet did. There's no fig on the tree. There's no fruit on the vine. The olive trees have failed. Uh, the fields have failed. There's no food in the fields. There's no herd in the stalls. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. Can we say that? Sometimes when we face these things and we, we get that far and we stop, can we say, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. When, we're, when we have no strength, he is our strength, and we rejoice in that. Um, the last two, that's really the end of the, uh, the book here. I did put another couple of uh, notes there. I called them things to consider. This, I would say, is kind of like a homework ass assignment for you. <laughs> I wasn't asked to give you homework, and as I say, nobody's checking. <laughs> Nobody's going to write that, but I thought it would be interesting, an interesting exercise because as I was reading through the, this book, uh, two things continue to jump out at me. Things that we consider, th what do we learn about God? Things we learn about God in the book of Habakkuk. First of all, we learn things through God's name. And I just saw these different names that were coming up for him. 
Lord Jehovah, we read that repeatedly. It's in verse 1, but you'll see it over and over again. That word Jehovah means the self-existent one, the one who has no beginning, no end, the one who has no creator. Uh, he is the sustainer of himself. He has no outside influence. My God, Elohim, the one who is infinite, all-powerful, holy one, that is the one who is sacred, the most holy or most pure. In verse uh, 12, we also see a rock, the mighty God, God, the defender of his people, the Lord of hosts. 2.13, we see that, Lord of hosts. When we talk about the Lord of hosts, uh, this is one that's not used very often in Scripture, but it is used both in the Old Testament and the New. Uh, but it refers to him as that military leader of the armies of heaven. Um, that is the, the Lord of hosts. And then Adonai, Lord and Master. Um, so each one of them tells us a little bit more about God. And so again, as you go through your study and you're going through that, you might want to underline those words because they some of them are repeated over and over again. And then read the context of it again. Because when we talk about Jehovah, the self-existent one, we think of God in a certain way. And so think about the context in which that was written. The other thing we learn about is through God's attributes. And so I just made a list now, there are many attributes of God, and uh, this is a list. There probably are more uh, than these, his attributes. And so what I did is I put a little space next to it. So as you read through those things, start looking for verses that you can put against that, that will teach, uh, that will tell you something about God's sovereignty, about God's eternality, the fact that he is an eternal being, his omnipotence, that means all-powerful, uh, his mercy, his self-existence, his transcendence. When we think about transcendence, that attribute of God is that he is so high, so great above us that we can never know him. Uh, he's more than we could know. And then we go to his goodness. Look for examples of that in verses, his justice, his imminence. Now, this is one that's interesting because when we think of God as the one who is transcendent, it's the one that we can never, never, never know in, in completeness because he is so great and so large that we cannot fully know him. And yet his imminence means the one who is drawn close to us. God wants us to know him to the, to the extent of our capacity to know so he's both transcendent and imminent. That's an, that's an amazing uh, uh, combination there. That he is so great that we could spend the remainder of our life seeking to know him. And God wants us to know him. And he reveals himself to us over and over and over again in his word. But his imminence, his immutability. God's immutability means one who never changes. He's not like us who, you know, we decide to do something one day and then the next day we change our mind. We're always changing our mind. Uh, God is unchangeable. Omniscience means all-knowing. Uh, omnipresent means ever-present. He's present always and all times. But his love, his grace, and of course his holiness. Um, one thing that's interesting as we read through those things, and if you can find those, maybe there's not one for each one. Maybe there is. I think there is. Um, there are several of those that we can never enter into. We cannot be omnipotent. We cannot be omniscient. We cannot be all-knowing or all-powerful. We can't be transcendent. Uh, we are very knowable. Um, but we are called to show mercy as he shows mercy. We're called to show love as he loves. God loved us first. That's why we love him. Uh, his grace, God's grace is greater than all, but we can show grace. Uh, we can be holy. We're called to be holy. Now, we will never be holy the way God is holy, but we can enter into those things. So some of those things, although they're attributes of God, he invites us into them and says, I want to see these things, characteristics in your life as well. And so as you go through that study as you, uh, over the next uh, few weeks, as you look into those things, hopefully these things are helpful, just about putting the context of why this book was written, where it was written, but also what's the practical application for me today? What can I take from this book that I can use uh, in my life each day? Let's pray. 
Our Father, again, we just thank you for, um, for these prophecies. Uh, we thank you for the uh, fact that these things have been kept for us. They have been saved for us to read and to learn from. Uh, Father, help us to understand the heart of this man, Habakkuk, uh, a man whose heart is very similar to ours, a man who saw uh, fear and doubt and questions, uh, but he knew the source and he came to the source. Uh, Father, we pray that we might be like Habakkuk and that when we doubt, we don't try to resolve these things in our own uh, strength or power or wisdom, but that we would come to you, uh, that we would lean on you for these things. Uh, Father, as we read through these things, uh, we pray that you would help us to know you better, that we would understand more of your character, that you would help us to understand how we can walk more closely with you. And our Father, we thank you for these wonderful reminders of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the anointed, the one who would come to bring uh, redemption, uh, who would bring reconciliation, who would rescue us from our sins and put us into a new relationship with you. And so, our Father, we just pray uh, for each one here today. We just pray that you would bless them, encourage them. Uh, you know the, uh, the prayers of their hearts, the burdens of their hearts, uh, the challenges, the trials that they're facing today. Our Father, we just pray that you would encourage each one, strengthen each one, and again, just draw each one of us closer to you, we pray. We pray these things in our Savior's precious name. Amen. Thank you.